Well, hello, children of God, holy children, saints of God, of the house of God. I'm Philip Shields, host of Light on the Rock, and I'm really, really excited about this particular Pentecost because there's so much I want to really get into. I might have to hurry through uh, the topics we normally spend a lot of time on on Pentecost. I'm, that doesn't mean that I don't think they're important. It just means I need the time to be able to spend on the things at the end that normally don't get discussed as much, more exciting things. So this day is called Pentecost in the New Testament, and it means 50. Uh, not count 50, not 50th, it just simply means 50. I looked it up in the interlinear several times, that's what it is. In the Old Testament, it's called by different names as well, and uh, uh, Feast of Weeks, or Sabbaths or Weeks, Shavuot in Hebrew, and uh, seven Sabbaths are counted, and then Pentecost is the day after the seventh Sabbath. We'll read that in a second here. In Light on the Rock, Pentecost will therefore always land on a Sunday. We do not keep the way the Orthodox Jews do, where it's always on Sivan 6. There'd be no need to count 50 days if it was always on a set day. There would be no need to count. So anyway, Feast of Weeks, Exodus 34, 22. Let's start there. You shall observe the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits. I want you to really, really catch that. Of the first fruits. And um, of the wheat harvest. And he says the Feast of Ingathering. That's later the Feast of Tabernacles. Sukkot at the year's end. Now, so we don't keep Pentecost when the Orthodox Jews do because they start counting from the first holy day of unleavened bread instead of counting from the regular Shabbat Sabbath that's in between the first and last day of unleavened bread. That's why they have a Sivan 6. So anyway, Leviticus 23, 15 to 17. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath. And they felt that Sabbath means the holy day, a high day. No, no, we feel it's the weekly Sabbath. From the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths, not just seven weeks, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Verse 16 of, Ex of Leviticus 23, count 50 days. So Pentecost means 50. To the day of, to the day after the seventh Shabbat in the Hebrew. The day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to Jehovah, the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves, bread now, of, of a certain weight, and they shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. Now the wave sheaf of the barley was without leaven. This wave sheaf of the, it's actually two loaves, uh, are baked with leaven. They, those two loaves, are the first fruits. These two loaves are the first fruits to Jehovah. Please understand, I'm going to emphasize what the Bible emphasizes, that Pentecost is all about first fruits. Verse 21 says, this day is a holy convocation, a time to meet with God and worship Him. Other days for this holy day include Feast of the Harvest, Exodus 23:16. It's also called the day of first fruits of the wheat harvest. Day of first fruits of the wheat harvest. Numbers 28, 26. And who do the first fruits refer to? James 1, 18 and many other verses say we. Those of us who have God's spirit, those of us who are the church of God, those who, of us who are called by God now, led by God, we are the first fruits of his creatures. Because, you see, God is not trying to save everybody right now. If he is, he sure is failing. He isn't. He isn't failing. It's just he's not calling everybody right now. He's calling first fruits. And until you fully grasp that Pentecost is about first fruits, which we are, you're going to miss the depth of of the meaning of this day. Christ was first fruits, first of the first fruits of the barley harvest uh, during the spring 
of the during the days of unleavened bread. <clears throat> we are first fruits of the wheat harvest, which comes a bit later after the barley harvest. Now the questions sometimes come up, should we even have to be keeping any of the holy days? And many, many, many Christians feel that no, the holy days are just a shadow of Christ and the promises and things to come. Uh, we now have come to Christ, so we don't need the holy days. Let me ask you this, though. We're going to read in a minute where Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem until they received the promise of the Father and are baptized, immersed in the Holy Spirit. And then he began, God began his New Testament, New Covenant church on this holy day, a holy day, Pentecost. Tell me if it makes any sense for God to do that, if God is wanting us to understand that we don't keep his holy days in the new covenant. Why would he make them wait? Why would he give the Holy Spirit on the holy day if we're not supposed to keep it anymore? Some of you keep Passover and that's it, but you don't keep the Pentecost, you don't keep uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Thank God the early apostles didn't think like that. Didn't think that they uh, don't have to keep Pentecost. No, they came together in one accord, together. Acts 2 says that very clearly. They met on God's holy day. Why would God have his church, the new covenant church, begin on a holy day if all the holy days were no longer needing to be kept. We find also in Acts 20, verse 16, that Paul hurried so he could be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. Another time he stayed in Ephesus uh, until Pentecost, 1 Corinthians 16, 8. The church clearly knew about Pentecost. They clearly knew about Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, Christ our Passover. 1 Corinthians 11, talking about the days of unleavened bread and Passover and the Lord's Supper and all of that. Now, one more thing I want to cover real quickly. I'm moving very quickly because I want to get to the, the main points that are not covered so well in the last part of the sermon. I have many sermons that address how God's holy days show us the plan of salvation that God is not trying to call everybody right now. But I want to point out here that when the Bible talks about the feasts of Jehovah, of the Lord, the word feast comes from either one of two words, either moed, moedim in plural, or it comes from hag, C-H-A-G, not chag, hag, which means more like a feast that we think of a feast of eating and drinking and so on and merriment. But moed or moedim has more to do with an appointment, a divine appointment with God. Leviticus 23, verse 1 and 2, Yehovah spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and uh, say to them, the feast of the Lord, the Yehovah, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts, not your feast, not the Jews' feast. These are my feasts. Hebrew word is moed, moedim, my divine appointments. These feasts are moedim in the Hebrew, okay, in the plural, meaning divine appointments. Most of the time when I'll be talking about feasts and many times in the Bible that talks about feasts, it is using the word moed for singular or moedim for plural, meaning God has set an appointment for you to meet with him. The other word, like I said, is hag, C-H-A-G. It means feasting, eating, and drinking. So sometimes you'll hear Jews or Hebrew roots people talking about the holy days and they'll say hag sameach, which means have happy holiday, happy holy days, have a good feast. Okay, a happy feast. So that's what they mean by that. But I focus more on the word moed, the, the divine appointment. So these festivals, these feasts, this Pentecost, are appointments, dates with God. Have you ever thought about dating the Son of God? Have you ever thought that the Sabbath each week and the holy days and Pentecost are dates set by him for you and he to meet together? Now, God's plan of salvation is revealed in the harvest of Israel. The holy days show us the sequence of God's plan of salvation, that it's not all at once. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 26, all of these are in the notes. And we, if it's on the video, we'll be showing them on the screen. Now, Christ is risen from the dead, has become the first fruits 
of those who have fallen asleep. So here again, he's the first of the first fruits. For since by man came death, uh, by man also came the resurrection. That second man is Christ. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, in the Messiah, all shall be made alive. But each in his own order. There's a sequence of events. And afterwards, those who are Christ at his coming. And I'm not even reading all the words afterwards and so on. Again, to save time, you can read them on the, what's on the screen and in your notes. Uh, Passover, remember, pictures the Lamb of God. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5, I think verse 7. And uh, the, the, the Lamb of God that God the Father provided for us to be the Passover. Behold the Lamb of God who, take away, who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. If Passover occurred on the very day, if Christ's death occurred on the very day of Passover, I want you to be thinking about this word first fruits and the resurrection. Now, Yeshua was the first fruits of the very humble barley, which was a soft grain, the poor man's grain. Uh, the very first signs of the barley often had that red stripe on them, by the way, which I've seen. If I can remember to do this, I'll make a note. I'll try to find the picture of the red strained barley and uh, send it to Scott Doucette, our webmaster. He and his wife work so hard for us here. And uh, they do a good job, very good job. And thank them very much. I'll try to send that to him to post if I can find it. Leviticus 23, verses 10 through 11. That's about the barley wave sheaf depicting Jesus. It's on the screen now. And uh, you, know, you shall bring a sheaf. It doesn't mean a sheaf like we think of it. It's an omer here. It's, 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 it was really flour, very fine flour that was presented to God. And he shall wave or raise up this fine flour, this omer. It can mean a weight, it can mean a, an amount, it can also mean a sheaf, it can mean different things. To be accepted, all underlined in my notes there, to be accepted on your behalf. So when Jesus was resurrected, he had to go to God the Father on the same day, so God the Father would accept him, yes, you did it perfectly, and therefore all of us who are in Christ are in him also accepted, by the Father. I hope you get that. That was all about Jesus. He was the very first of the first fruits of God's callings. And uh, so that's why in John 20, verse 17, he says to Mary Magdalene, who was touching him, holding him, he said, Mary, it's not touch me not. He, she was trying to hug him and hang on to him. She was pleased to see him. He's saying, Mary, you got to let me go because I have to go to my father and your father my God and your God. And that's why. Then later on that very same day, he came back down and saw the disciples, the apostles who were meeting for fear of the Jews behind locked doors. In John 20, you can read all that story. The next harvest in Israel was the wheat harvest in the late spring, early summer. As the, as the barley was finishing up, the, the wheat was getting ready. On Pentecost, two leavened loaves of the first fruits of the wheat. Are you li listening to some key words here? Leavened and first fruits of the wheat were being offered uh, to God. Two loaves were being raised up, elevated up to heaven and brought back down. So keep that in mind. That's going to play big in today's sermon. Now, let's talk first of all the primary meanings of Pentecost as we do understand them. Most of you, the first three or four points that I'm going to cover, uh, know these very well if you've been in the church for a long time, but it's good to review it. It's Pentecost Day. The giving of the law. In Exodus 19, verse 1 and 2 show that it was the third month since leaving uh, Egypt. That puts you right at Pentecost. It is Jewish tradition that Exodus 19 and 20 happened on Pentecost or Shavuot. And God says to them in Exodus 19, verses 10 and 11, that they were to wash. Read what I have on the screen there. Go tell the people 
to consecrate themselves today, set themselves apart, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. On the third day, Jehovah will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. They won't see him, but they'll see the glory of Jehovah coming down. There'll be much more said about all this as we keep going. And then in Exodus 19, continuing on in verse 16 to 20, what I want to point out is when God did come down, there was great thunder and there was a great smoke and there was fire. There was a dark cloud on top of the Mount Sinai and it was burned at the top. And Mount Sinai, Paul tells us in Galatians 4, is in Arabia. Remember that it was the same mountain that Moses fled to when he was fleeing Egypt as a 40-year-old, and he fled to Midian, to Midian, which is modern-day today Saudi Arabia, where, where that was located. So that's where he went, and that's where Mount Sinai was. Anyway, uh, verse 16 and 17, uh, thunderings, lightnings, and the sound of, and also a thick cloud, and the sound of the trumpet, the shofar, I believe the word is here, was very loud. So all the people who were in the camp trembled. It was so loud, it was scary loud. They heard it. Are we going to hear the trumpets of God in the future? We might. We really might. And Moses brought the people out to meet God. And in verse 18, now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because Jehovah descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like a smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. God does seem very comfortable in and around fire. Okay, himself. I've had people tell me God doesn't like fire. Well, that's not what I'm reading. Not at all what I'm reading. It's what you'll read in Revelation. Verse 19. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder. Where am I? Okay, uh, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then Jehovah came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And so God called Moses to go to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Now, remember the mountain on top was all on fire. It was on fire. And so it wasn't just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who experienced going and surviving fire. I think it's very likely that Moses was called right into the midst of the fire to meet with God. And he survived, but it must have been scary because we read in Hebrews 12, 21 about this. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. That's Moses. And then we go to Exodus 20, the giving of the Ten Commandments, it's called the Ten Words. Uh, and, uh, and, and they're spoken by Yehovah. Remember that no one has seen God. Uh, the Father, but people will have seen this one, as you'll see. And uh, Jesus told the Pharisees, you have never heard God's voice. I don't think he was saying nobody has ever heard God's voice, because certainly here they did. But those Pharisees he was talking to, I think that's in John 5 or someplace where he says, you have not heard. You've never seen him nor heard his voice. But we know that Peter, James, and John all heard the voice out of the cloud on the Mount of Transfiguration. We know that. Peter says so. He says they heard it. I think that's in 1 Peter, maybe 2 Peter. In the beginning, you'll, you'll see it. Now, so God gives his covenant. He gives his Ten Commandments. And, of course, they were already keeping the Sabbath. God set the, the Sabbath day upon creation, the seventh day. Uh, they knew about the Sabbath in Exodus 16, before this Exodus 20, about when the manna would come. Uh, they knew about clean and unclean meats in Noah's day. Uh, so God codified it here, and uh, it was part of the covenant. And so in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, we'll post the verses up here, you'll be reading them. God says, Behold, the days are coming, says Jehovah, I will make a new covenant, a new covenant, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not... Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. This new covenant is not an old covenant simply renewed. Not like that one. No, he says, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. Remember that. 
But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So God married Israel at Mount Sinai. You, that's my second point. The first point is God gave the law. Second point, God married Israel at Mount Sinai. Exodus 24, verses 1 to 8. Yeah, the blood was sprinkled, sealing that covenant between them and God. And I think that was just a foretaste of the marriage of God, or Jesus at least, the Word of God, with, uh, with his bride in Revelation 19. Isaiah 54, verse 5, we'll put these up there. Your maker is your husband. It says other things beyond that. Jeremiah 3, 14, return to me, you black, backsliding children, says Jehovah, for I am married to you. And then in Exodus 24, verses 9 to 11, we see that Aaron and Moses and Nadab, Aaron's two oldest boys, sons, Nadab and Abihu, probably Abihu or something like that, and 70 of the elders of Israel, so about 74 of them, went up to Mount Sinai, and God gave them a, God gave them a meal, maybe a prototype of the marriage supper. I don't know, maybe. But it says in Exodus 24, verse 10, and they saw the God of Israel. They saw him. God didn't kill them for seeing him. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. It was like the very heavens in its clarity. But the nobles, on the nobles of the children of Israel, God did not lay his hand, for they saw God, and they ate, and they drank. I think a type of the marriage supper, perhaps. And then Moses alone was called beyond that to go higher up to be with God at the top of the mountain. So this concept of Pentecost picturing the marriage to God is an important one. And uh, it's, it's critical to remember because it's going to happen again. It was about Pentecost also uh, that Boaz and Ruth got married. Uh, Ruth, we're told, Ruth 2.23, began gleaning the barley and the wheat when it was ready. Uh, and then they got married. Um, so... Boaz, I believe, was a type of the Messiah who saves us, uh, who's our Goel, the kinsman redeemer who redeems us. Ruth was a type of the church, including Gentiles. She was a Moabite, remember. It's all in the sermon. I want you to hear the sermon, Ruth, Boaz, and Pentecost. Ruth, Boaz, and Pentecost. It's, on the, it's up there right now in 2024, and I gave it several years ago, but I think it's a good sermon. I think you'll enjoy it. Pentecost, okay, number two, God married them. Uh, number three, Pentecost was uh, when God gave the New Covenant Church his Holy Spirit. You know the, the verses, but first let's read Acts 1, verses 4 and 5, the giving of the Holy Spirit. And being assembled together with them, he, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait, wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be immersed, baptized completely with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So he says, wait until you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And verse 8, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be witness of me all over, okay? And then chapter 2, verse 1. I'm hurrying this through so I have more time at the end. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord. They were all in one accord. That doesn't mean a Honda, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, like a tornado or something. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They were in a house. And there appeared to them divided tongues of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Remember, there are 120 of them who had gathered, according to the end of chapter 1. 
men and women were in this group. And not just 12 apostles, but 120, counting Mary and counting other women that are mentioned at the end of Acts 1, and men. And they were all filled, including the women, including the men. They were all filled, all means every one of them, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you keep reading, you realize that at least in this particular time, the people who were there heard them. I might be speaking in English, and if there was a Chinese man there, he would hear me in Chinese. At the same time, a German man might hear me in German, or a Greek man would hear me in Greek, and so on. That was the experience of that particular day of Pentecost. The giving of the Holy Spirit is absolutely vital for any of the rest of the sermon to be able to be accomplished. I have a sermon titled 22 Things, the digits 2-2, two, two. 22 Things. Just type that in the search bar, you'll see it come up, 22 Things. When you use the search bar, by the way, uh, it's best just to use one or two words, not three, four, or five. Uh, you find a wider search, the smaller number of words you use. So 22 Things would be fine. 22, so I can't go through them all right now. I'll put the link to the sermon in my notes as well. Here's some of the things, though. The Holy Spirit, first of all, opens our mind to spiritual things so we can understand it. 1 Corinthians 2 talks about that. And I need to uh, uh, find out the exact verse in 1 Corinthians 2. I think it's around 9 or 10, but where it says spiritual things are only discerned by the Spirit. Holy Spirit gives us the very presence of God himself, God the Father and Jesus Christ, come and live and make their abode inside of us, according to John 14, 23. And that, in turn, consecrates us, makes us holy people, makes us saints. Saints comes from the Greek word hagios, means holy, holy ones. If I were to ask you, are you a holy person? Your correct answer, if you have God's Spirit, should be yes. It doesn't mean you're living perfectly all the time. But yes, you're holy with God in you. Wherever God is, is holy. Even dirt. Maybe you think you're just dirt. Even dirt's holy. God told Moses when he was standing there in front of the burning bush, Moses, take your sandals off. For the ground, the dirt you're standing on is holy ground. So dirt can be holy. Anything that's dedicated to God's use or God's presence is holy. When God comes into me, in spite of any sins I've done and you've done, that makes us holy. And God forgives us and, and makes us clean again. Holy Spirit begets us into the family of God. I'm not trying to go through the all 22. I'm just giving you a few of why this is such an important thing. It begets us into God's very family. We're not going to be angels. We're not going to be something else or just spirit beings. We're going to be part of the very children of God. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, I have a series. If you would look up the word um, breathtaking, just type in that one word, breathtaking. And it goes into this very concept of what God is doing. And he wants family. God's spirit gives us God's very own nature. It's DNA, if you will. It puts God's power in us. It gives us the peace of mind to know that God has promised with the Holy Spirit to finish what he started in us. The word there uh, that we're told about the Holy Spirit is that it's a down payment. It's an earnest in the King James. When you'd buy a house, you had earnest money. You had down payment money showing that, yeah, I intend to fully buy this house. And uh, the, the Greek word there for earnest or down payment is arabon. A-R-R-A-B-O-N. Guess what the Greek word for engagement ring is? I saw it with my own eyes. I had them tell me I saw it in Greek, by an engagement ring. How do you say that? What do you say that in Greek? They said arabona. Arabona. Very similar to arabon. Because it's the promise to truly finish this, to marry this person that you pledged yourself to by giving her a ring, your engagement ring. So God's Holy Spirit is the guarantee of God's salvation. 
Guarantee of it. He, uh, the down payment to finish what he started. Philippians 1, 6. He who started a good work in us will complete it. I think it goes on to say to the day of the Lord or something. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. He who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us as God, who has sealed us. You're sealed now. Remember the 144,000, Revelation 7, are sealed then. That's not us, because we're already sealed. I'm reading it. 2 Corinthians 1, 22, Who has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. As a guarantee. All of this is pictured by Pentecost. But oh, there's so much more. So much more. When we realize our bodies are now the dwelling of God. He lives in me and lives in you as imperfect as we live sometimes. We should be very careful. It should make us much more careful to be careful what we're doing, where we're going, what we're watching, what we're, how we're dressing, everything. That we're pleasing to God, pleasing to Him. Now, for the rest of the message, let's get into the other very, very exciting meaning of this day, I believe, that doesn't get a lot of publicity, doesn't get preached a lot. Number four, I believe Pentecost is the more likely time of the first resurrection. Pentecost is the more likely time of the first resurrection than in the fall. We've been so indoctrinated that the return of Christ and the first resurrection, the last trump, all happens on the Feast of Trumpets in the fall. I'm going to show you the rest of the time here. That cannot work out. Of course, we all believe the first resurrection happens at the last trump, which is the seventh trump. There are seven trumpets that are mentioned in the book of Revelations. Book of Revelation, I mean. Uh, scripture clearly says this. 1 Corinthians 15, let's start reading in verse 49. We'll go to 53. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 to 53. As we born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. The heavenly man is Jesus. The man of dust is Adam. That's what Adam means. It means dirt. It means a dust. Red dirt. Verse 50, now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. When you see pictures of lion and the lamb, that's not the kingdom of God. They're being ruled by the kingdom of God. But flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. I tell you a mystery. We're not all going to die. We're not all going to sleep. But we shall all be changed as in a moment, in, in the blink of an eye, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. It has nothing to do with President Trump, former President Trump, as some of people have said. No, don't go there. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Right now in the flesh, I'm corruptible. But when I'm raised to spirit, I will be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Other verses talk about this flesh must become spirit. So because trumpets are mentioned at the last trumpet, many churches believed, and I did for the longest time, for decades, that it must be referring to the Feast of Trumpets. But remember a couple of things. Trumpets were blown on all seven holy days and even on the weekly Sabbath and on the new moon. Trumpets were blown a lot, not just on one Yom Teruah Feast of Trumpets. Okay? Numbers 10.10 10 says that. Numbers 10.10. 10. Blow the trumpet on all these days of your gladness. A super loud trumpet and shofar was blown on this day, on Pentecost, on Mount Sinai. We read it earlier. 
It was so loud that people trembled. So trumpet blasts are not the exclusive domain of the Feast of Trumpets. Another point, <clears throat> Pentecost is all about first fruits. It's the day of first fruits, Numbers 28, 26. It's the feast of harvest of the first fruits of the wheat. Read that earlier. It's all about first fruits. The first resurrection. So Pentecost is all about first fruits. The first resurrection is all about first fruits. So just as Passover was the very day when Christ our Passover was sacrificed, the resurrection, which is all about first fruits, surely, surely would have to be on the day of first fruits. Surely. Let that sink in. And why were we so artificially forcing that first resurrection about first fruits into the fall holy days, which has nothing to do with the first fruits? The first three holy days are about those God is calling now. The last four holy days, starting with the Feast of Trumpets and Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, and Eighth Day, have to do with those God will be calling when Christ returns and working with from that point onward. The word for trumpets, Feast of Trumpets, in the Hebrew is Yom Teruah. Yom means day, not Yom. Okay, Yom Teruah. Blasts, shouts, noise, trumpets as well. But trumpets were on all the holy days. Plus, there's a huge logistical timing problem after the first resurrection if you put it in the fall. People seem to have forgotten this, but there are things that happen after the seventh trumpet that when we're changed to spirit. There's still seven last plagues we read about in Revelation 16. After, that start after the seventh trumpet. And those seven last plagues will take at least a few months. One of the seven last plagues, the sixth one, the drying up the, of the Euphrates so the armies from the east can come across, that alone will take weeks and maybe a month or two. That one alone. So let's pick up the story flow with a sequence in the book of Revelation. You may have to listen or watch this sermon more than once to get it all because I have to keep moving. And also later take the time to go back through the book of Revelation more slowly using these notes. And I think it will all start to make a lot more sense to you. The book of Revelation teaches us that there are a series of events that must take place before Jesus returns. <clears throat> there are seven seals that are mentioned in Revelation. Um, hang on just a, sec, just a minute. There are seven seals that are mentioned in Revelation 6 and 7. The first six in Revelation 6. And then the, uh, the seventh seal. Let's talk about the seven seals first. The first six include the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the fifth seal is the great tribulation. And then the sixth seal is the heavenly signs and the sun and the moon not giving their light. And then you have the seventh seal, which now you're in Revelation 7, and the sealing of the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel, minus Dan. And then a great number of people, so many, they're innumerable, uncountable, who are people who have come to Christ, have repented, have washed their robes in the blood. They've repented. They've come to God. So besides the 144,000 from Israel, there's also an innumerable number of Gentiles who also come to Jesus at the very end. So take heart, you Gentiles. Then the seventh seal, Revelation 7, has seven trumpets that blow, the seven trumpet plagues. You can read of the seven trumpets in Revelation 8, 
and 9, especially those, the very scary chapters 8 and 9. Be sure to read them, but not just before you go to bed. It covers the fifth and sixth trumpets, Revelation 9 does, especially. And the 200 million man army. I think it's the sixth trumpet. And a third of all whatever is left alive by that point in the world, a third of them even now get killed by these guys. I wish I had time to read all that, but that's okay. So you have seven seals, and then you have seven trumpets. The fifth and sixth trumpet are nasty, scary. The seventh trumpet, the last trump, is when we're resurrected from the dead or changed to spirit. We already read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 52. Let me type something in here. And that's where it says that flesh and blood cannot inherit, and we shall be changed to spirit. Okay? So that's, 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 that's got to be understood. Uh, we're resurrected on the, the last trumpet. Now, 1 Corinthians Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. This is often used by people who believe in the rapture because it says caught up with them. The Latin word there is rapturity or rapture or something. You know, that's where they get the word rapture from. But that's not at all what it's talking about. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. Let's read it. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel, probably Michael, and with the trumpet of God. And the, remember, trumpets are blown on all holy days. And I believe this is Pentecost we're talking about here. And I'll show you as we go further along. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to, there's where the rapture Latin word comes from, and they, uh, those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, the world teaches a pre-tribulation rapture, mostly some teach a mid-trib or a post-trib, but uh, I, I don't believe at all in a pre-trib revela uh, uh, rapture, I mean. But anyway, those of us who are alive, so don't, don't think I'm teaching a rapture here, I'm not. But we will be caught up with him, yes. And we will meet him in the, in the clouds, yes. But when does this happen? And what happens next? Remember, Jesus said he would return in the clouds of heaven and that he would send out his angels to gather his elect, his people, who are scattered all over the world. So let's read that in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31. So there's a... Seventh trump, the last trump, we're changed to spirit, we're raised up to meet Christ in the air. But let's read the background to it. Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31. <clears throat> Immediately after the tribulation. So those who are teaching and preaching a pre-tribulation, or pre-trib as they call it, rapture, seem to miss this verse. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, which is the fifth seal, the tribulation, the fifth seal of Revelation 6, the sun will be darkened. Now we're getting into the sixth seal, the signs in heaven. And the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, or look like they're falling, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then, Matthew 24, 30, after the tribulation and after the signs in heaven, verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. They're not just all in one place of safety. Many will be, but there will be others, the remnant whom Satan will go back and, uh, and uh, torment and, and persecute. Remember on Pentecost that two leavened wave loaves of wheat, two loaves of wheat, big loaves, were, 
raised up to heaven by the priest, and of course brought back down again. Who and what do the loaves picture? In Leviticus 23, verses 16 to 17, I think I've read this earlier, but count 50 days to the day after the seventh Shabbat. That's why we do Sunday. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to Jehovah. I shall bring two loaves, okay, made of fine flour, baked with leaven. They are the first fruits. They are the first fruits. So the two loaves that were raised up on Pentecost were clearly told are first fruits. And we read in James 1.18, we are first fruits. So the two loaves picture us. God's people. But remember, it is, they are leavened. We have been sinners in the past. But keep in mind that once you leaven bread and bake it, it can no longer continue leavening anything else. The leavening is done. So we too, if we're in Christ, though we in the flesh still sin, in the spirit, in our spirit, we don't want to. We have nothing to do with it in our spirit. We're done leavening, being leavened. In the flesh, we still do until we're until the corruptible puts on incorruptible. Anyway, so I want to say that. But then after the seventh trumpet, there are still seven last plagues, taking months. So there we are, changed to, you, to spirits with Christ in the clouds after the seventh trumpet sounded. And now what? What do we do now? Our traditional teaching is we kind of hover over Jerusalem for a while and then come back down and land on Mount of Olives, but there's not even the army yet below us. They're still coming or have to come across the dried up Euphrates. Okay. Because that's one of the sixth seals. I mean, seven seals. It's the sixth, sixth seal. It's the drying up the Euphrates. Now, did you know that? <laughs> Revelation 11, then, that we, is about two witnesses. Okay, Revelation 8 and 9 uh, talk about the seven trumpet plagues. And then now we're in Revelation 11. It's about the two witnesses who are killed at the end of their three and a half year mission. They're resurrected again just before the sounding of the seventh trumpet, not with it, just before it. They are the first to be resurrected of the first resurrection. And then we read this uh, uh, about the seventh angel in Revelation 11. The two witnesses have now been brought back to life. Now we read this, Revelation 11:15, And then the seventh angel, the last trumpet angel, sounded. There were loud voices in heaven, saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones, so this is happening up in third heaven, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was and is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. And read verse 18 also. And then verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven. The temple of God is opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen. There was great lightnings, noises, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. Huh. The temple of God is opened. Revelation 12 is about the woman who is protected from the beast power trying to killer. They're taken to their place in the wilderness, a place of safety. Some do not go. They're called the remnant, whom Satan does go after at the end of Revelation 12. These are people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 13 is about the beast power and the false prophet and warnings not to take their name, not to bow down to their image. But in Re Revelation 11:19, heaven is opened. Why? Revelation 19. Remember uh, where we are now. The seventh of the last trumpet. The seventh of the last trumpets has now sounded. We've been changed to spirit. 
We are now with Christ in the air. There are now seven plagues that have to happen. The temple in heaven above us now is opened. So what's happening now in the third heaven where God the Father rules and the Lord Jesus Christ is? Let me explain what the problem with the timing, the old timing that we had, the problem that we had with that. Because there are still seven last plagues to go through, all listed in Revelation 16, you should read it, there's a huge timing problem to have the resurrection happen at the end of the seventh trumpet and then somehow what happened to the seven last plagues. These take months to go through. We're in the clouds with Christ. Then what? The armies from the east mentioned Revelation 16 and 17 aren't even in Jerusalem yet. Not the quantity, not the full number. Remember again, the first three holy days is about those God's calling now, the last four about those God's calling later. Since the first resurrection, hear this carefully, since the first resurrection is made up only of those who are first fruits of God, does it not make much more sense at the first resurrection than most likely happens on the Feast of Pentecost? This feast is all about first fruits. Feast of Trumpets is not about first fruits. Feast of Tabernacles is not about first fruits. Day of Atonement is not about first fruits. Okay? So the first fruit saints have been resurrected. What are those in the first resurrection doing? Next, and while the seven last plagues are going on, are we just hovering in the air over Jerusalem? Some teach that, that God has a portable sea of glass somehow hovering over Jerusalem. I don't see that in Scripture. So what do we read? First of all, let's understand where the sea of glass is in the thrones. Revelation 4, verse 6. Revelation 4 describes the throne of God and what it looks like up there. You ought to read it. I'm going to pick one verse, Revelation 4, verse 6. And in front of the throne, before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne, God's throne, and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Four living creatures. Other verses talk about the 24 elders who are also there. Now let's jump to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verses 1 to 5. And then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, like the voice of thunder. Sound of harpists playing their harps. Verse 3, they sang as it were a new song in front of the throne, before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. Where is this? Where are the four living creatures and the 24 elders? It's heaven, third heaven, heavenly Jerusalem. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. They're still not on the earth now. They're redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, spiritually speaking, for they are virgins. They're the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruits. People who are called now, in this age, first fruits. They're called here first fruits, being first fruits to God in the Lamb. The end of verse 4. Verse 5. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault. That's what happens when you accept Jesus as your Savior, and, and He is now your life. That's what happens. They are without fault. Where are they? Before the throne. Of God. Can it be any clearer where these people are? These are people redeemed from the earth, called first fruits, 
in front of the thrones of the 24 elders and the four living creatures, and the end of verse 5, before the throne of God. They're in heaven. Now let's go to Revelation 15. Remember the sea of glass is in front of God's throne as we read this. Revelation 4, verse 6, we read that earlier. Now let's go to Revelation 15. I saw another sign, where? In heaven. Great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is complete. Remember, we don't suffer the wrath of God. Many verses say that. We don't suffer the wrath of God because we came under God's love and protection. Verse 2. Oh, we suffer the wrath of Satan who tries to persecute us in the tribulation and all that, but not the wrath of God. Verse 2, Revelation 15, 2, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast. They, they didn't bow down or over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. They did not take the 666. And whatever we all do, we must not have anything to do with the beast power, the 666, when we find out exactly what all that means. Okay, these are them who are, have the victory standing on the sea or beside the sea of glass. The Greek word there can mean beside. Either one, on or beside, whatever. The sea of glass is there is my point. Having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb. Saying, I love this song, by the way, uh, that I know of. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. So where are these people who did not submit to the uh, beast's power? Where are they? Tell me. They're on the sea of glass, or they're where the sea of glass is. They're where the thrones are. Okay? Where's all that? All that's in heaven. So these saints and first fruits are clearly in the third heaven, heavenly Jerusalem, clearly, right? Before the wedding of the Lamb takes place in Revelation 19. During all this time, the seven last bold plagues on earth are being poured out. You can read them carefully yourself in Revelation 16. Uh, they include everything from painful sores to the seas being turned to blood and fish dying, and then uh, fresh water turned to blood, a scorching heat, severe darkness and pain. And then plague number 6, verses 12 to 16 of Revelation 16. The river Euphrates is all dried up. And then they make, so, the, so the way can be made for the armies, it says, to come through. That's going to take months, many weeks at least. And then uh, plague, plague number seven, the greatest earthquake the world has ever experienced, it says, ever. And it sounds like it's, de it's describing an earthquake that goes all around the world. And then uh, great 75 pound and 34 kilogram hailstones are hurled down. Many cities are destroyed. Every island disappears. Mountains disappear, are leveled low. While all this is going on earth, we don't want to be here. We're up in heaven. We're in the third heaven, in heavenly Jerusalem. I just read it to you in Revelation 14 and 15, that the saints who didn't give in to the beast power, uh, the first fruits, are where there's a sea of glass and where there's uh, thrones of God, the death throne of God and the thrones of the 24 elders and so on. We're there. And what would we be doing all there all that time? We're going to get married there. But before the marriage supper, or during that time we're up there, remember, we're not part of the Earth's time and space requirements. It might seem like we're up there thousands of years. Or it might seem like we're just there for a moment. But anyway, we're there, and I'm sure Jesus will show us the mansions he's prepared for each of us in our city. Mansions does not mean offices like I was taught when I was young. It's ma mansions, places you live in. Here's your house in a city that's as big as half the United States. Lots of room. I can't wait. 
You Kenyans are going to love these houses that God, these mansions God's preparing for you. Not like the little rental place that you have now. I think we'll get to see and meet the prophets and the wives of the prophets. Sarah and Naomi and Ruth and Esther and Rebecca and Mary, Mary Magdalene and all the great women of the Bible as well as all the great men of the Bible, the prophets and the leaders, King David and others and Rahab, Bathsheba. And whatever you do, don't go to Bathsheba. Oh, you're the one. I know what happened to you. Don't do that. God forgives us all of our sins. We've all done things equally bad or worse. Don't go to Rahab. Oh, you're Rahab the harlot. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, you're Thomas, doubting Thomas. Don't do that. Those things are past. But we'll get to meet everybody. And they'll get to meet us. And we'll get to meet the Father. 1 John 3, verse 1 and 2 says, We shall see him, God the Father, as he is, for we shall be like him. And what father would not want to see his children when they're born in the resurrection? And we'll be getting ready for the marriage, the marriage supper, the wedding supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But before going there, there's a, le there's a lesson we can learn from Isaac and Rebekah. You can read the story how Abraham, who pictures God the Father, was looking for a wife for his son, Isaac, who pictures Christ. And the wife, Rebecca, is going to picture the church. So he sent a servant out. He's not named. I always thought it was Eleazar, but it may not be. Maybe someone else. Just like God sends out angels to work with us and bring us to him and so on. Anyway, he sent out a servant to find a wife for Isaac. And the servant prays that God would guide him and lead him. And he prayed to God. Rebekah was found at the springs of water, not just a well, but the Hebrew there implies running water, living water, springs of water. Her name is Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, which means house of God. He's finding a wife for Christ from the house of God. From the dweller in God is what it can also mean, Bethuel. She's a good person, probably a very young woman. Isaac is, uh, is 40. She draws water, not just for the servant, but for his camels. He had at least 10 camels. A camel, I'm told, can drink 40 gallons when they're thirsty after a long trip. Can you imagine how much drawing of water she was doing here. And then she decides to go back with the servant with her maids on ten camels. And we pick up the story in Genesis 24, verses 61 to 67. If you're not familiar with the story, go back and read it. Rebecca and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the man. The servant took Rebecca and departed. Isaac, verse 62 Genesis 24, 62. Isaac came from the way of Ber Lahai Roy. He dwelt in the south. Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. We should all meditate, ponder with God. That's what he was doing, away from his tent. Just like Jesus is away from heavenly Jerusalem when he comes to gather his elect. And he lifted his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. And then Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel, for she had said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It's my master. So she took a veil, covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. And then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. Very significant. Sarah had died. Sarah was no longer alive, but they kept her tent up for whatever reasons. Isaac thought it would be the right thing to do to take Rebekah, inspired by God, to go into Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And so Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. 
So remember, Isaac was in the field. Jesus in the field, so, so to speak, as well, to collect his bride. And then he takes her to uh, his deceased mother's tent, Sarah's tent, and consummates the marriage there in Sarah's tent. What does the Bible have to say about that? What does Sarah represent? We're told, and I'll put the scripture up there, you can read it. I'll put it in the notes. I'm running out of time, so I've got to hurry. Very important. Galatians 4, verse 22 to 26. It's written that Abraham had two sons, one from a servant, a bondwoman, Hagar, the other from a free woman, that's Sarah. He who was born of the bondwoman, that's Ishmael, was born according to the flesh. In other words, there was a fleshly act, there was sex involved, and a child was conceived and Ishmael was born. He of the free woman through promise. He was born through faith as a, as a miracle, which things are symbolic. These are two covenants. Goes on from there, and then at the end in verse 25 and 26, it says, Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all, picturing Sarah. So the fact that Isaac took Rebekah into Sarah's tent, I'm using Galatians 4, 25 and 26 to show us that in fact, that pictured heavenly Jerusalem, getting married in heavenly Jerusalem. That's what I believe anyway. And I stick to it. <laughs> now, so we'll be married to the Son of God. Remember also the parable of Matthew 22, verses 1 to 3. Jesus gave them a parable. The kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. Let that sink in. Kingdom of heaven. It's like a certain king. Who's that? That's God, the Father, who arranged a marriage for his son. Who's that? We all know that's Jesus. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited and so on, but they would not come. Okay, but the king puts on a wedding. Why wouldn't he? Where else are you going to have a wedding for your son, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, that is befitting him, except right there in heaven? And where is the certain king who puts on the wedding for his son? Jesus said, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So when the Father puts on a wedding, it's in heaven. It's the kingdom of heaven. All pictured by Isaac taking Rebekah to Sarah's tent. Are you getting it? Christ comes for his first fruit select, just like Isaac had to go on the field and get Sarah. And all this is happening, I believe. Since it's all about first fruits, and since the first resurrection is all about first fruits, it makes no sense to put first fruits in the fall. None. So we are resurrected with Christ on Pentecost. We go to heaven, and during the next three to four months in heaven, earth months in heaven, the seven last plagues are being poured out. We're getting to know the, the area that's going to be our city, our mansion, our team that we're working with. Are you getting excited yet? I sure hope so. I prayed you would be. So know this, this feast day celebrates the first fruits of wheat, that's you and me, picturing the brethren, the church of God. And I also believe that this season, this Pentecost season, pictures the time between now and the fall, probably closer to Pentecost, when the wedding with Jesus Christ takes place. Just like Isaac wasted no time in consummating the marriage, I think Jesus, when we're with him in heavenly Jerusalem in front of the Father, will waste no time marrying us. So more and more Holy Day keeping teachers and pastors are coming to the same conclusion that we're resurrected on or near Pentecost, probably on Pentecost. The wedding supper takes place very soon after, maybe on the very day, but very soon after. All pictured by the two le uh, leavened wave loaves, all pictured by the first fruits. Then you go to Revelation 19 and we read all about the wedding. Revelation 19. I heard a loud voice, a great multitude, where? In heaven. 
saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power belong to the Lord our God. It goes on from there. I'm in a hurry, so you've got you to read it yourself. Then verse 4, the 24 elders, where are they? Revelation 4 says they're in heaven. And the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne. Where's God's throne he's sitting on? In heaven. Verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of the great multitude, the sound of many waters, the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah. Any of you who think you should never use Hebrew words, every time you say Hallelujah, you are. Hallelujah means let's all praise Yah. Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let's be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. We make ourselves ready by repenting of our sins and accepting Jesus as our Savior and letting him live his life in us. And to her it was granted, given to her to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. Given to her. Because the linen represents righteousness. For the fine linen, as your Bible should say, is the righteousness of the saints, not the righteous acts. We don't work our way into heaven. We don't work our way into being the bride of Christ. We don't work our way into having righteous garments given us. They're simply given us as a gift from God, as I preached so many times. Go back and read Romans 4, verses 20 to 24. It wasn't to Abraham only that the righteousness of God was imputed, but to us also, Romans 4, verses 20 to 24. Romans 5, 17, the gift of God's righteousness. God's righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He who committed no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And on and on. Jesus in me lives his life again in righteousness in, in, in us, in him doing it. It's him doing it. It's his glory. It's his righteousness. So that's what I actually should say. Where your Bible says uh, the, the, the fine linen at the end of verse 8 is of righteous acts of the saint is wrong. Look it up in the Greek. It's for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And I, be, I believe Young's, liber, Young's liberal, Young's literal translation, I believe, I'm going to look it up, I believe says that. And that's what it should say. And then he says in verse 9, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these are the true sayings of God. Then, point number six, Jesus, after the marriage supper is done, gets on a white charger, along with all the holy angels, along with the saints, and there's a verse, I'll put it in the notes, where it says it's not just him and angels, all, but the saints also come, I think that's in Thessalonians and also possibly in Jude, where it's not just the angels, but also the saints. We're all coming back with him, and uh, Revelation 19, 11 to 21, we're all going to be on angelic chargers. We're not going to be on flesh and blood horses. We're in the kingdom of God. There's no flesh and blood in the kingdom of God. It's all spirit. It's all spirit up there. So now, by the time we're coming back to earth, we, Christ has come back to collect his saints. First round in the re, in, in coming. We meet him in the clouds. We go to heaven. When in heaven, we introduce to everybody and we see our mansions and we get married. And then from heaven, we come down and when Christ came the first time, he came in clouds. When he comes back with the angels and with us, now to take possession of ruling the earth, he's coming with spirit chargers, horses. A lot of the angels look like animals. They look like animals that we're very familiar with. Both the good and the bad angels look like creatures we're familiar with. I think we'll feel very much at home, except angelic horses, angelic cows, angelic eagles, angelic oxen, and so forth, are incredibly powerful, incredibly smart. Not like flesh and blood, okay? You'll get that right. Anyway, so um, God says in verse 17, or the angel says, 
Come and gather together all you birds for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and so on. A lot of people are about to die. And then verse 19, Revelation 19, 19. I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. That's the, that's the angel, and we'll be part of that. And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and who worshipped the image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with sulfur. That's brimstone. When, and the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. We face the armies that are there. We defeat them. You can read all about that in Zechariah 14. I won't have the time to read it. I'll put it in the notes. Zechariah 14. How all the armies of the world come against Jerusalem. And at first, it's not good news. At first, the city is destroyed. At first, the women are raped and ravished. And some taken into captivity. Then God intervenes. Then he fights us in the day of battle. Zechariah 14 describes how they're killed and destroyed. So let's wrap it up. I hope you're excited. You're going to heaven. It's your city, in fact. It's the city of God, but it's your city. Abraham wanted to look to a city whose maker, builder and maker was God. Hebrews 11 says that. It's our city. That's why it's called the bride in, I think, Revelation 21. It's called the bride because that's where we're going to be. That's where we live. All right? And we are God's first fruits who are going to be resurrected on the day of first fruits. Who are, the first resurrection is all about first fruits. And when God's Spirit came on Pentecost to start the new covenant church, there was a promise of completing what he started. And so uh, the two leavened loaves, that pictures us. The 144,000 first fruits, that pictures us. There are others in Revelation 15 who are also there. Saints are clearly depicted as being in heaven, Revelation 14 and 15. In the third heaven, where we get married, there wouldn't be any other proper place to get it done. The saints marry the Word of God, the Son of God. And then we return with Him, and we land on the Mount of Olives. It splits into Zechariah 14, and big earthquakes and everything. And then we begin to reign for a thousand years. And it will not all be smooth sailing in the beginning. Don't even think for a second that it will be, because it won't. Hallelujah and praise God. Hallelujah and praise God. I hope you're excited about this day. Yeah, we're going to heaven. We're going to heaven to see our home, to get married, to see the city that will be our city, and then to come back. Oh, Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before you and we raise our hands in love like a little child raising his hands to see his father as we come to you and just ask you in Jesus' name to hear this prayer. Father, many of us have lost a lot of zeal. A lot of your people are no longer zealous. Forgive us, Father, forgive us. Let us be restored to zeal, to zealousness. And please come into our lives actively. Please let us get excited about what you have in store for us. Help us repent of where we fall short. Help us get more righteous and holy by letting Christ live in us. Thank you for this day. Thank you for all it means. Father, be with our people all over the world. Bless them, Father. Give them help because so many of them are so poor so many of them need your help so many need healing please pour out the holy spirit and the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit please pour it out and we receive that as we love you and we praise that you pray that we will love you even more father and love you even more yeshua in jesus holy and righteous name amen <laughs> Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization 
providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.